Alrighty. So today we will be getting into a few chapters of Ezekiel, also looking at some things in Revelation. So we're continuing the study of the tribulation. Uh, we're looking at it from a different perspective from if you've ever done a class on eschatology, a class on end time prophecy before. We're covering things a little bit differently because I like focusing on some of these Old Testament prophecies because I love pointing out the fact that the mentions that it has in the book of Revelation are not unique to the book of Revelation. They just happen to be all comprised into one beautiful little vision right there. But we can always backtrack and find these things older. So especially today, we will be, we will be looking at temple abominations, the third temple abominations. Again, if you know anything about the news, the third temple does not exist yet. One of the things that I, I tried um, saving it since I don't have Internet here. Um, I tried having the Web page open, but then the laptop restarted. Long story short, I sent it to your phones. It's a article. It's an article that I just ran into today. It was uh, released on May the 6th, 2022. Um, this is a, a Jewish publication, Israel 365. It's titled the Jews begin building third temple on Israel Independence Day. Now, it's a little provocative that that title. They're not necessarily building it like this per se. But what they have started, if you read the whole article, it's it's a little long. It takes maybe like five minutes to read. Um, what did happen is that on their Independence Day, a small group of Jews decided to, well, you know what? Um, God said that it was a good thing, a good deed for us to be begin working on, on the building of the temple. So even though we cannot politically, even though we cannot legally build on the temple mount, one of the things that we can do as a good deed towards God is begin working on these stones. So they're chipping away at stones. And one of the things that they want to do is essentially create a movement from that thing right there. And ideally, what they're hoping is that this begins a movement of getting more and more Jews involved to wanting to build the temple and, and putting their heart essentially into the work. So and, and if you know anything about, you know, what's happening here politically, uh, not only is it impossible, all borderline impossible to get this done because uh, the, 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 the golden mosque is there. I, I can't remember the name. The Dome of the Rock is there. Um, and there's billions of Muslims that would not want that to happen. At the same time, because there are so many secular Jewish people in Israel, um, they're, they're not really pushing for any political movement for that to happen now things have begun to change roughly in the past 10 years where some do want it a movement is slowly growing but will an article like the one i just sent to your phones will that also help continue that sort of movement but again i just kind of wanted to share some current events because as i was saying previous classes these classes will begin to look more and more like current events are we there yet no but we're definitely getting closer so with that being said, we're going to look basically into the depths of the tribulation towards when there's already a temple and there's already some problems going on with the temple. Uh, so for so we'll begin by looking at Ezekiel 8 and, and we'll just continue. I'll have most of the verses up here, but feel free to open them up in your Bibles. I always recommend, you know, read these words yourself like that. You you have a, a connection with them. So I'll start over here. Um, from Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, it says, It came about in the sixth year, on the fifth day of the sixth month, and I was sitting in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord fell on me there. So a vision came to Ezekiel. Verse 2, Then I looked, and behold, a likeness as the appearance of a man. From his loins and downwards was the appearance of fire, and from his loins upwards were the appearance of brightness, like the appearance of glowing metal. Verse 3, he stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by the lock of my head, by a lock of my head. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the idol of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy was located and behold the glory of god of israel was there like the appearance which i saw in the plain so to summarize this really quick he's 
he's um he's before some elder some elders, but then God's spirit kind of picks him up, takes him up by the hair. <laughs> and um while while he's taking him in between heaven and earth, now he's showing him a vision. Uh although the vision is occurring there, the vision that he's seeing is a is pertains to what will occur on earth. He is seeing now the temple. So what does he see? The north gate of the inner court. When he says that, he's not talking about a palace. He's talking about the temple, the temple of, of Israel, um, where the seat of the idol of jealousy. Do we know of any idol that pertains to the tribulation? First off, historically, there's only one idol, false idol that has been in the temple, but that was not erected by the Jews. That was erected by uh, Antioch Epiphanes the fourth, um, which led to the whole Hanukkah and all that stuff. But that was not one that they decided to put up there. That was one that he declared. So, again, if we're speaking of an idol of jealousy, we're getting we're speaking of, you know, we're, we're starting to think of the tribulation. We're starting to think of that false idol of the of the Antichrist and all that stuff, which provokes jealousy, which where it was located. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there. So all that stuff. Let's continue. Verses five through six. Then he said to me, son of man, raise your eyes towards the north. So I raised my eyes towards the north and behold, to the north of the altar gate was the idol of jealousy at the entrance. So at the entrance of a particular gate, that's where that idol is. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations which this house of Israel are committing here so that I would be far from my sanctuary. So God is saying because of what they're doing with that idol, it is causing me, the God speaking, to be far from my sanctuary, that his presence has left. The temple that is how angry he is with the people of Israel but yet you will see still greater abominations so something is going on again I love so when when we're reading a uh, Bible prophecy it never tells us this pertains to the tribulation this pertains to the church this pertains you got to look at the context clues again speaking of the context clues we're speaking of a temple so it couldn't have been any time these past 2000 years because there was no temple. We're also speaking of an idol in the temple um, that could have only have occurred one other time, which was during Antioch Epiphanes uh, when when he erected an idol. Um, but that doesn't really apply because it is them that are committing them. It is the elders that are committing this sin. So the only time prophetically speaking Thinking of the context clues and trying to put it into a timeline, it has to be in the tribulation. So to already put your frame in mind, we're looking at Ezekiel 8, yet we're looking at the tribulation. Again, it is not unique only to see the tribulation in Revelation. You can find it all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Bible. So let's continue reading Ezekiel. Okay, so then he brought me to the entrance of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And he said to me, son of man, now dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall and behold an entrance. So there's a temple. He's in the temple. He sees a small hole and there's a hidden entrance, an entrance that should not be there. Uh, he digs through and said, go in and see the wicked abominations that they are committing here. So I entered and looked and behold, every form of creeping thing and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved all around. So imagine that in the midst of the third temple, in the, of the temple of God, there is now this hidden area where all these blasphemies are 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 occurring. Blasphemies against God. Let's continue standing in front of them were the 70 elders. And this is one of the key clues that I'll begin to break down in a moment. The 70 elders of the house of Israel uh, with Jazaniah and the son of Sh Shaphan. Standing among them, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, I, I can't remember which is which. Um, no, there's a second man. Um, oh, there you go. Never mind. The 70 elders is one group of people and Jazaniah is the high priest. Historically speaking, he is the high priest. Now, because we're looking at prophecy. Will it be Jazaniah or will it be the high priest? For the sake of the vision, it could have been Jezaniah just so that he understands it as the high priest. But for the sake of the prophecy, I do not believe it'll be Jezaniah. Um, but let's continue. Uh, 
was standing among them, each man with his censer in his hand and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. These are all uh, temple instruments. Uh, verse 12, then he said to me, son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark? Each man in the room of his carved images, for they said, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Also, let's ponder on that really quick. What would cause these religious Jews in the temple of God to say that God has forsaken the land? So again, if we are speaking of the tribulation, could it possibly be with, but now we have the false Messiah, their Messiah, and we have the third temple, yet there's not peace on earth. There's calamities and destructions that are occurring, as we see from the book of Revelation, all these calamities that need to occur. And is that why they declare, for God has forsaken the land? Are they so in, in a scramble and loss of faith, similar to what happened when Moses was up with God and they and the, the Israelites created a golden calf. Is this now the elders scrambling and also just clinging on to, to false gods? It's speculation, but, you know, one of the possibilities of, you know, what's going on in their minds. Just I, I really want to paint a picture of what's happening, essentially, during the tribulation. Uh, so the Lord has forsaken the land. And he said to me, yet you will still see greater abominations than what they are occurring, that which they are committing. So we're already in this hidden area and we're seeing some bad things. Now, I'm going to argue that this hole in the wall exists today. It is the chamber of hewn stone, which is something that was important. Uh, it, it, it's where the 70 elders sit. Uh, and this is area exists right now this where do you guys think this is this is under the temple mount of israel why do they have an underground synagogue is that an actual picture of it? yeah this is an actual picture of it not a rendering or anything look up underground synagogue or chamber of hewn stone or anything like that um and it exists today and there's currently excavations happening to continue to make this bigger so this is where the 70 elders sit at the back here, there's more seating. This is for the for the um, students. The one thing that I don't see is a seat for the high priest, but they do have this very large pomegranate um, that seems to be made out of gold. Um, although synagogues typically have a pomegranate, I've never seen one that large, uh, me personally. Um, some have argued, argued this kind of looks like the sun and it kind of looks like they're worshiping the sun. I don't know if I could go too far with that. Um, but that's what some people have said. But so have you ever been to Israel? OK, so imagine you're at the Wailing Wall. Yeah. So that's the Jewish side. Imagine you're getting closer to the Wailing Wall. I'm not I'm not a thousand percent sure what the entrance is, because I remember finding out about this after I left. Um, but imagine you're super close to the wall. I believe that there is some kind of entrance towards the left side um but but it, it's it's very large if i'm not mistaken like this is not just one section there's also a grand hall there's a lot of things that are underground and even so i've never been to this specific spot um but i have been underground like in the ancient city of david david things like that and and different tombs and i was easily walking with my friend underground for at least an hour and these tunnels and everything, all the, and there's still things that need to be excavated. A lot of things that Palestinians are preventing them from, from excavating because every time they, they excavate, they find second temple coins, second temple uh, uh, little things proving that that belongs to the Jews, essentially. But thinking back of Ezekiel 8, they're at the temple. Ezekiel digs through goes underground essentially through some dirt and stuff like that and he finds more things happening and who's with him the 70 elders what exists today under <laughs> underground where the 70 elders sit right now i can't say that there's abominations because also i don't know how to read hebrew i don't know what it says on those things i would assume it's clean for now but what ezekiel argues is that one day in his vision there will it will be full of idolatry so that's just um, something to keep in mind. Now, what does this pertain to in historical uh, uh, context? This is the 70 would be the Sanhedrin, 
the same ones that accused that that uh, judged Christ. So the Jewish high court of justice consisted of 71 men, 70 being the elders and the one being the high priest. That would have been uh, uh, Jazaniah that we read in, in Ezekiel chapter eight um, and led by the high priest. The council could decide almost any fate of its people except the death penalty. They could decide the death penalty just during the the during the time of Christ. They couldn't because the Romans took away their their ability to um, condemn, which is why they had to take them to to Pilate in order to condemn him to death. Um, they lost that. But biblically speaking, uh, uh, with the rules that are laid out in Leviticus and the Old Testament, all that stuff in the law, they have the ability to condemn someone to death for corporal punishment, in other words which was decided by the Romans. So the council could decide almost any fate of its people except the death penalty, which was decided by the Romans. The court was located within the chamber of hewn stone inside Herod's temple. So in this particular case, the chamber of hewn stone was over here. But from what we're seeing um, nowadays, what exists today is that this happens to be underground, which more closely resembles what Ezekiel was seeing in, in Ezekiel chapter 8. Um, so let's continue to look at other stuff. So there's more, there's more to Ezekiel chapter eight. Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for T Tammuz. Tammuz is a God of fertility, if I'm not mistaken. And the women are crying out for him. He said to me, do you see this son of man? Yet you will still see greater abominations than these. So I kind of wanted to give you. Again, this is a second temple uh, layout, but you can the, the third temple will roughly look like this. Uh, maybe some things changed here and there. Um, but check this out towards the north. He brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north and behold women. So the context clues being the north gate and where women are sitting. So, again, based on this layout, it would I would assume it would be the court of women. And this is east, so this would be north. It, there's several gates in the north. I would guess, you know, it's probably this gate or that gate, the women's gate or that one. Um, that's probably what he's saying, that around here, the the women are crying for another God. Imagine. Um, still, you will see worse things. Then he brought me to the inner court. So the inner court would be this section, um, the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the entrance of the temple, so around here, uh, this entrance of the temple, the, 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 the Holy of Holies, in other words, between the porch and the altar. So I would assume that the porch is this and the altar is this, the brazen altar uh, where, where sacrifices is cast. By the way, brazen altar, bronze altar, um, bronze symbolically is um, reminiscent of sin. So whenever you see that Christ's legs are bronze, highlighting the fact that he died for our sins, like all these. Uh, I guess idioms and symbols of, of material, they're consistent also. Uh, that brazen altar, it's for sin offering. But whatever, what do we see here in Ezekiel 8? And behold, at the entrance of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, there were about 25 men with their backs to the temple. So looking this way, um, and with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they were prostrating themselves eastward towards the sun and he said to me do you see this son of man they have their backs towards the holy of holies do you see the son of man is it too light of a thing for the house of judah to commit the abominations which have been committed here that they have filled the land with violence okay we're going to talk about that also that they the jews have filled the land with violence let's think about that we'll talk about that in a moment and provoked me repeatedly for behold they are putting the twig to their nose that's, um, I guess, an idiom to kind of say like they're they're putting the twig right here, like for God to go bah! and basically hit, it's like saying, oh, you know, I'm putting the nail to my head kind of thing and you're just going to hammer it through. Um, so he's like, they're provoking me. They're putting the twig right there just for me to, you know, hit them. Um, therefore, I indeed will deal them deal in wrath. My eye will have no pity, nor will I spare. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice. Yet I will not listen to them. So. 
I'm not sure when else I cover it, so I'll mention it now, that they have filled the land with violence. Um, it seems from these context clues that we get, and I do believe that we see it again, that it is the Jews also in Israel that are killing others. The assumption is that when the Antichrist comes about and the Jews that adhere to that Antichrist um, and, and when the Antichrist says kill those who do not believe that they will go out and do God's work killing others. Yet that is, in fact, angering God. Um, because I always love researching this stuff and seeing any kind of latest news about a year ago, I ran into this YouTube channel called it's a, a run by by a Jew, a, a religious Jew called We Want Moshiach. Now, I was I was so happy because I was like, this guy is giving me gold. He has no idea what he's sharing. Usually they keep hush hush about these things. But after a few months or weeks, the channel was deleted. Um, but whatever they were talking about, similar to that video that I shared with you, that they gave a candidate for a messiah, not saying that he's the messiah, but gave a candidate in that same channel. Um, he shared a video of a Jewish prophet um, saying that when the messiah comes, the false messiah, the antichrist, that um, if you do not believe, if you do not bow down and all that stuff, you will be killed. I'm like, hmm, that sounds exactly straight from the pages of Revelation to those who not bow down to the Antichrist, they're going to be killed because, again, in their mind, the Messiah needs to be king, which, yes, we believe that Jesus will be king. Every knee and tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Um, but they may even do it by force, by force of, of human power and not by God. Um, so, again, just these these ideas, they, they continue throughout the Bible. So let's continue reading. So the Lord's wrath again. Um, now, now um, going into Ezekiel nine, even though it's technically a different chapter, uh, do be aware it's the same vision. So sometimes these chapters they might throw us off. Sometimes these verses they might throw us off. A lot of times they're helpful, but do be aware it's the same vision. So starting from verse one, then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice saying. Draw near, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. So now God is calling on his executioners. They're going to execute individuals in the in the city. Verse two, behold, six men came from the directions of the upper gate, um, which faces the north. So I'm not sure exactly what gate, but this would be the north. So somewhere by here, I would assume each with his shattering weapon in his hand, and among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a writing case at his loins. Uh, and they were, and they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. So what I'm assuming of these executioners is that they're the angels that also come and kill. Uh, and, th and, and there's a passage of time. I'm I'm thinking that Ezekiel chapter nine is now much towards the end of the tribulation. Mind you, you got to remember if there's already these abominations happening in the temple, we're speaking about the second half of the temple. I mean, I'm sorry, the second half of the tribulation. So you got to remember that. But now getting into Ezekiel chapter nine, it seems to be even the later half of that second half, um, because now it's the judgment coming to these individuals. And we're going to look at some verses in Revelation to also kind of put them in, in context, since we are a lot of times more familiar with those verses in Revelation. Um, destroying weapon in each hand. Um, I find it interesting that there is a man clothed in linen with a writing case at his loins, um, like a little, almost like a little stenographer, <laughs> almost, if you want to think about it. Um, I'm not sure if that is Christ or just an angel. I don't know. But with the writing case, I think I, I'm not 100 percent sure, but probably that writing case is writing down everything. Like if, if they're not in the book of life, writing down everything that that person did wrong, like knowing, keeping an account so that the executioners know who to go ahead and destroy, essentially, um, so that they're essentially working together. So God is preparing there. There's been all this abominations happening in the third temple. I mean speaking future wise, there will occur all these things 
And then this is now God beginning to clean house, bringing in his executioners, bringing in his his people that are ready to kill, um, essentially. And what do we see in Ezekiel chapter nine? A seal to protect. So the, then the glory of the Lord of Israel, this is the same chapter that we're reading, just verse three. Then the glory of the God of Israel went up from the cherub. Um, so up from the cherub, that would be from the Holy of Holies at the center center where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's where the cherubim are on which it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called the man clothed in linen at whose loins was the writing case. The Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh, sigh being like, like not happy about what's going on and groan all over the abominations which are being committed in its midst. So essentially put a sign on their foreheads to protect those that don't agree with these abominations. Isn't that what happens in Revelation chapter seven? So check this out. Then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind could be blown on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. So same idea. We're going to seal people. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So, again, these things that we're seeing here, they seem to specifically pertain to what is going on in Israel, in Jerusalem, that these executioners are for the city. Not that they're going to come to Concord, these executioners, and also start executing things. This this is uh, pertinent to Jerusalem, pertinent to that city right there. Um, so how many are sealed? So if you combine both, both of, of the bits of the information, how many are sealed? 144,000. Who though? Jews. Um, why is that happening? Because they don't agree with the abominations that are going on. Um, and again, that seal being from God. So, it, so we see a seal on one hand being from God, but we also see a seal coming from Satan. When we're speaking of the mark of the beast, that is also a seal. Um, but let's continue. So continuing the same prophecy in Ezekiel nine, um, verse five, but to the others, he said in my hearing, go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children and women, but do not touch any man on whom is the mark. And you shall start from my sanctuary. So these executioners, as I was showing you from the layout, they come in and begin from the sanctuary. The, the, the cleansing that God begins is from the sanctuary and then out towards the city. And God was saying, don't have any pity. If they're worshiping, these abominations don't have any pity and kill all of them. Whether it's men, woman, child, all that stuff, wipe them out. Continuing. So. They started with the elders who were before the temple. Um, then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Defile in the sense that there will be dead bodies in the temple. Go out. Thus they went out and struck down the people of the city. As they were striking the people and I alone was left, I fell on my face and cried out saying, Alas, Lord God, are you destroying the whole remnant of Israel by pouring out your wrath on Jerusalem? So there was a fear from Ezekiel thinking that everyone's going to die. So that's sad if you think about it. How many, speaking of the tribulation, how many will worship the Antichrist? It seems to be a lot. But always, if we look at biblical history, there's always a remnant. What did, what did Elijah cry about? For God, I am the only one. I'm the only one left. No, you're not, buddy. No, you're not. There's... <laughs> There's 3000 left or something like that. But but there's a number left and the same idea is occurring here. There's a lot that are pruned, cut off from the from the from the branch, from the from the vine. Uh, but still, there's a remnant left. Now we see. This execution. 
also pertains to what we see in Revelation chapter 14. That same wrath occurs here in Revelation chapter 14. So let's start from verse 9 of Revelation chapter 14. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink from the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So how do you avoid being judged? How do you avoid... The, the, this judgment, sighing, groaning, hating the abominations that are, are happening. Again, speaking of Jerusalem, um, how do, and 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 also having that seal that protects you. Um, I also do want to point out there are those speaking back on the violence that the Israelites caused. There are those that died, and they were not sealed, but they didn't die by the hands of God. They died by the hands of Jews. You get me? It, you know what I'm coming from? Um, but whatever. Um, there was another thing I wanted to bring up. I'm kind of rewinding back a little bit, but looking at Revelation 7 and Ezekiel chapter 9, speaking of the seal that occurs, um, if you were to only look at one it gives you only a small view. If you look at both, it gives you a better view. The same thing that we do with all prophecy. We shouldn't base our, our knowledge on a prophecy just from one verse. And, and doctrine always comes from many verses, at least two witnesses. When you combine both, you get a better understanding. If you were to just look at Ezekiel 9, you might think that the sealing of the good people, of the 144,000, happens towards the, the end, the very, very, very end of the tribulation. But when you put it into context of Revelation chapter 7, you get an understanding it's actually happening before the beginning of, uh, of the tribulation. Um, it just so happens to mention them at that point in Ezekiel chapter 9 because it is relevant uh, at, that, at that point. Um, verse 11. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here in the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice in heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, so that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud sitting on the cloud was one like the son of man, having a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung the sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out from the temple which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel who has the power over fire came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vines of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city. The blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles, bridle, I don't know, uh, for a distance of 200 miles. So that's a lot of dead people. Let's reflect back on what we just read, just looking at some of the generalities. So similar to uh, Ezekiel, if you're with God, you have a seal that protects you. If you're not with God, you have another seal that does not pertain to God. At the same time, from verse 12 and 13, it's speaking of those who die that are blessed. It can only be speaking of those who have been persecuted. Um, and again, and again, speaking of the Jews that commit murder, that, that kill others um, in, in their violence, the violence in the land that they committed, as is stated in Ezekiel. So it all goes together. Now, continuing on here, where are the executioners from Ezekiel chapter nine coming from? They came from the temple. What do we see in Revelation chapter 14? These angels are also coming from the temple. These executioners, in other words, are coming from the temple and then they're swinging their sickle. 
one of the extra clues that we get from reading Revelation is that not only do they start in the city, but they apparently do it to the whole earth. So we get more context now. Uh, the, the, the clusters over the earth and the earth was reaped. Now, mind you, uh, a lot of times we think of wine and we might think of the church. We might think of the goodness and the reaping of the goodness. But this is the reaping of the wrath of God. Um, and, and that's that last part right here. Threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So being reaped in this portion is not in the positive. It is in the negative. It is uh, reminiscent of Ezekiel chapter nine, the executioners that kill those that are enjoying this kind of stuff. Um, but right there, there's that correlation to what's happening. It paints a better picture of what's happening in the tribulation. What is angering God so much? But, and the fact that there's all these abominations happening. So it stems back down to who you worship. Um, now let's look at Ezekiel chapter 11. Who was murdered? Um, just continuing on. Then the spirit lifted me and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's temple. And I saw 25 prominent men of the city. Among them was Jazaniah, son of Azor and Pelatia, son of Benaiah, who were leaders among the people. The spirit said to me, son of man. These are the men who are planning evil and giving wicked counsel in the city. They say to the people, it is not a good time to build houses. This city is like an iron pot. We are safe inside like meat in a pot. Um, we're thinking of that's how we cook pot, but they're thinking that's how they store pot. That's how they store pot. So oh, we're safe in this iron pot. Um, but watch how God still flips it on them. You'll, you'll see if you've read this before. Therefore, son of man, prophesy against them loud and clearly. Then the spirit of the Lord came up upon me and he told me, this is what the Lord says to the people of Israel. I know what you are saying, for I know every thought that comes from your, from your minds. You have murdered many in the city and it filled its streets with the dead. Again, pointing to the fact that it's religious Jews that are committing murder for the sake of their false messiah. We're going to read another verse in a moment, um, but I wanted to get back to this idea that there are those who want to run away from the city, yet these evil Jews, to put it in that way, these these uh, these that are far from God, they're saying, no, let's stay in the city. We're safe in the city. Meanwhile, others are saying otherwise, no, let's get out of the city. Um, and keep that in mind because it's going to be important in just a moment. So all of that. So all of these things of the murders we can uh, of, of who's dying during the tribulation. We can connect it to several different things, several different themes that we see throughout uh, the tribulation. First off, there's a connection with the fifth seal in the book of Revelation. What happens in the fifth seal? The. It is the believers that are being persecuted. It is the believers that are hiding under the altar that they're dead until the full number of all believers join in. What do we also see in Revelation chapter 11, which we're going to get into in a moment? The two witnesses were also murdered. They were murdered for preaching Christ. What does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24? In Matthew chapter 24, let's take a look at what he says, starting from verse 15. He says, the day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. So again, what is he talking about? He's speaking of Daniel chapter 9. He's speaking of the second half of the tribulation. He's speaking of the idol that we've seen in, in 2 Thessalonians, in the book of Revelation, in Ezekiel chapter 8. He's speaking of that idol. Um, when you see the sacrilegious, excuse me, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place, reader, pay attention. And that's not my editing. That's them putting that verse 16. Then those in Judah must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of the roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible will it be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days? And pray that your flight not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for there will be greater anguish than any at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. In fact, unless the time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive, but it will be shortened for the sake 
of God's chosen ones. So what do they say in Ezekiel chapter 11? No, let's stay in the city for we're like meat in a pot. We're safe. What does Jesus say? Run away, run away, run. When you see that idol, run. Forget about Jerusalem, run. You better pray that it's not in winter. You better pray that it's not during the Sabbath. I find it interesting that he does mention those things because a lot of these abominations, historically speaking, uh, speaking back to Hanukkah, all that stuff, that happened during winter time. Hanukkah, the, the, when the temple was desecrated, it might occur again at that time. I don't think it was just, I hope it's not in winter because you know it's cold, but it may just occur at that time again. And he tells them, run. I can only imagine. Again, being in Israel, and you've been in Israel, imagine being roughly near by the Temple Mount, you know, put yourself there, and you hear about the fact that this idol is now being there. And you remember Jesus' words, when you see that, run to the hills, run to the mountains. If you just turn this way, you see where the hills are at. You know where you have to run, and it's also away from the city. It, it, it's not it's not like this three hour trip. It's just run, get out, but begin running. Um, I, I, I believe that's eastward, like basically towards the Dead Sea, essentially. But run away. That's Jesus's advice. What do we also see? Again, this is still connected. Uh, Revelation chapter 12. What do we see with the dragon? The dragon first tried attacking the woman. He couldn't attack the woman. Then he began attacking the children of the woman, those who believe in Christ. Eventually, what we see in Revelation chapter 17 is that the dragon does get the woman. She's found in the wilderness, except now the woman is riding the beast. But before that, that attacking, uh, excuse me, again, reminiscent of the murders, the murders that will be occurring. Um, Revelation 13, the same idea. Um, those who do not worship that false idol and do not receive the mark of the beast, they will not be allowed to do a lot of things. And they will die because of that. So all these ideas are connected. Again, when we're speaking of the tribulation, we're speaking of religious matters that are occurring, that are affecting the world that is angering God. Angering God to the point of doing all these things. We'll take a pause here. Take a few, a few minutes and then we'll just finish off with the two witnesses. That shouldn't take too long.